I don't know how many of you have uh, heard me speak before, but I usually begin with a magic trick or a statistic that will shock you and get your immediate attention. But today, I want to start with a story. A story not too long ago when I checked into a hotel in Dallas, Texas. A young man, 18 to 20 years of age, takes my bags, brings them up to the room, puts them on the edge of the bed, and I reached into my pocket to give the man a tip, and I only had 32 cents in change. I says, wait a minute, I've got a great idea. Let me unzip my suitcase. I happen to have a copy of my new book, Impotence, It's Reversible. Now, you did not need to draw a serum testosterone level on this man to understand that he hardly needed the services of my book. He looks at the back of the book and he sees who the authors are, Drs. Wilson and Baum. He says, are you Dr. Baum or Dr. Wilson? I said, I am Dr. Baum. And he says, well, Dr. Baum, if it's okay with you, he says, I'll just take the 32 cents. <laughs> now, I hope to be able to give you a little more than 32 cents worth of useful information about the relationship between nocturia and falls and fractures. I also have to make a disclosure. You know, when you give one of these talks, you're supposed to disclose what companies you work for, who, who you have spoken for, what scratch pads you've received, what pens you have received from the pharmaceutical industry. So I have to make a disclosure. I did not write this book. The book was written by Dr. Wilson. But I did create the title. And it's the title that made it the New York Times bestseller. <laughs> Falls and fractures are a huge problem. One in four people over the age of 65 are going to fall. I'm one of those. I'm that, I'm that person on the right end edge of that slide. I have noticed my uh, difficulties with balance as I've gotten older, and I recognize that I'm at risk. And guess what? So are our patients who are at risk. There are over uh, 29 million people will fall each year over the age of 65. 30,000 deaths each year. From falls, and fracture, from falls and fractures. And less than 50% of patients are going to discuss this with their physician. I have never had a patient come in to me and say, I'm having nocturia, I'm at risk for falls and fractures. They don't say it. We have to elicit that. That is our responsibility. So where do we as urologists fit into this scenario of falls and fractures. There are so many comorbid conditions that we treat on a regular daily basis that are causing nocturia. The lower urinary tract symptoms are very common in men over the age of 50. Urge incontinence in women is a risk for falls and fractures. And the studies show that the greater the frequency of nocturia, the greater the risk for falls and fractures. And nocturia, nocturia is the leading factor for nighttime falls and fractures. And we have an opportunity to impact that and to change that and so my purpose of this presentation is not to teach you how to treat nocturia, but to call to your attention this relationship 
and what we as urologists can do to change that. There are so many medications, medications that we prescribe that can result in orthostatic hypo hypotension and can result in nocturia, putting them at risk for falls and fractures. So what's the urologist's involvement? What can we do? First, we've got to recognize it. Then we need to treat lower urinary tract symptoms. We need to recognize what comorbid conditions. And we have, if there are comorbid conditions, we have to report that to the primary care physician, uh, to the orthopedist if it's a mobility problem, to the uh, physical therapist. Even the pharmacist needs to be aware of this relationship. Also, patients who have osteoporosis, osteopenia, are at risk for a fracture if they fall. We have a responsibility because we are treating patients with kidney stones to watch what we do in terms of dietary management to give them, make sure that they are, if appropriate, on calcium and vitamin D. Patients who have vision problems, for a simple example, and I recognize this myself, I had bifocal glasses and I noticed that when I would take a step or go up a step or down a step with the bifocal glasses, there was distortion uh, and a, a change in perception. And so it is recommended that patients who are at risk for falls and fractures, particularly when it's not involving reading, that they use single focus distance lenses. Also, we need to make sure that they have barrier-free access to the restroom, or if not, they can use a urinal. A lot of this can be done by your medical assistants, your nurse practitioners, and your physician's assistant. I'm not suggesting that the urologist who is so uh, overwhelmed now with the amount of patients we have to see in the contracture of time, that we can't do this, but people in our practice can do this. So what can the urologist do in regarding screening for falls and fractures? Well, one, if they've had a history of, a, of previous falls, then we need to make sure that we are taking care of their urologic problems so they aren't having so much nocturia. Patients who are agitated, patients who are uh, wearing bifocal lenses or are visually impaired. Patients who have transfer mobility, walkers, canes, are going to be at risk when they have urgency in the night. The urologic approach to nocturia, I trained 1972 to 76. In the 1970s, the management of nocturia in men was, the only diagnosis we had in the 1970s was BPH, and the treatment was the TURP. We were told at that time to avoid the use of anticholinergics in patients with BPH. We were told at that time, remember we were told, don't give testosterone to patients with prostate cancer. It's like putting a gasoline on the fire. And the same thing we were told in the 1970s, never give patients with BPH or obstruction uh, an anticholinergic because you'll throw them into retention. Well, that's changed now. We don't, we don't have that admonition. And the urologist, in terms of nocturia now today, it's more, a whole lot more than BPH. These are just the majority of the classifications of the drugs in 2009, uh, the conditions in 2019 that are associated with nocturia that we see on a regular basis. Again, the list is quite extensive. And if you're just a, if you are a clinical urologist on any given day, you are seeing men and women, you can estimate that nearly half of the patients that you see on a regular basis have a problem of nocturia and we can do something about it. So what are the goals of therapy? Um, I have these in the reverse order. So first we have to relieve any outlet obstruction. Now we have 
the, uh, the possibility of increasing the bladder capacity. And third, I'll talk for one slide on we have the capacity of the ability of decreasing urine production. So for looking at lower urinary tract symptoms, we need to look for the low-hanging fruit. And the low-hanging fruit is looking at the medications that our patients are on that are contributing to nocturia. We can advise them to restrict their fluids. We can treat these other conditions that I talked about uh, in the previous two slides. We can give them medications for overactive bladder if we have ruled out bladder outlet obstruction. And then we can easily evaluate in a single visit uh, a patient for outlet obstruction and uh, uh, treat them first with medications, uh, which we're all familiar with. And now we have the ability to use minimally invasive therapy for the management of the enlarged prostate. There's two kinds of polyuria. Uh, the one which is the global polyuria, we don't see very, uh, we seldom see or are not responsible for treating. But the one that we do see uh, most of the time is nocturnal polyuria. And so what can we do? Simple thing, you know, make sure the you know, patients who is on Lasix or a diuretic takes it early in the day rather than late in the day. If they have congestive heart failure, diabetes, we can refer them. We can encourage them to decrease their fluid uh, intake. I haven't found that to be very successful, nor have I found it to be very successful to encourage men to decrease their alcohol uh, intake. But sleep hygiene is a simple thing. My wife and I are constantly arguing about the temperature in the room, and that seems to be kind of pervasive, but particularly in older uh, men and older women. Women like it 72, I would prefer it 68. And that is a big difference to me, and I am much more comfortable you know, at 68 and sleep better than when it is at 72. Um, uh, encourage patients who have venous stasis to wear the stockings, get, make sure that their primary care physician is knowledgeable about that. Uh, also, obstructive sleep apnea. I had a patient who was telling me that he was, you know, getting up, you know, six, eight times at night going, you know, to the bathroom, and I asked him how he slept and did he snore. He didn't, he wasn't aware of his snoring, but his wife was and shared that they had to have separate bedrooms because of the snoring. Referred him to a, a sleep lab or he had a sleep study. He had six to eight apneic episodes an hour. And he was hypoxic during this time. He was at risk you know, for stroke and heart disease. Uh, he had got a CPAP uh, uh, mask, and he said his whole life turned around. Less nocturia, more energy in the, during the day, uh, improvement in his uh, libido and sex life, and he significantly, he wasn't aware of this, reduced his risk for heart disease and a stroke. So we need to look at it. But you can't ask the patient, do you snore? They're, they're, not, they're not aware of it. You have to ask the partner. Let's look at um, overactive bladder and uh, detrusor overactivity. Uh, Anti-muscarinics, I think we are all aware that we have to be careful about the use of uh, oxybutynin in, in the elderly. I have taught, the patients aren't aware of it, but the caregivers will tell you that there's cognitive impairment in older people who are taking oxybutynin. So I think although that's you know, uh, the least uh, expensive, and the pharmaceutical, uh, the insurance companies will mandate to you, you must try this before you try second and third tier uh, anticholinergics. Uh, I think you have to put your foot down and say, this is contraindicated in this 75-year-old lady or man. B3, 
uh, adnergic agonist mirbetric. And now we have the capacity with the desmopressin to decrease urine production. And the mechanism of action is that it absorbs water from the uh, collecting duct and it is at risk for uh, hyponatremia. Uh, the incidence of hyponatremia is very low, two, two to three um, percent. Let me ask uh, Dr. Kira, do you check the serum sodium on patients that you put on um, routinely? Do, okay, so that, that's a good uh, caveat, it, even though it's very uh, low incidence, you should check the ser serum sodium. Uh, our program director said in the AUA consensus statement, he said, uh, consideration of newer formulation, these are the uh, ADH uh, drugs, when contraindications to ADH is eliminated and other interventions are not optimal. And so there is a role for ADH for treating of uh, nocturia, uh, nasal sprays and, and, and tablets. So in summary, we see patients who are at risk for falls and fractures because of nocturia every single day. Third, there are 30,000 deaths annually as a result of falls and fractures. Usually, the problem is multifactorial. There are multiple comorbid conditions in the elderly that contribute to uh, nocturia. We have to identify those, and we have to ask the patients, you know, about their comorbid conditions and make sure that they receive uh, pro proper follow-up. Bottom line, we need to identify the risks for falls and fractures and bring those risks attention to the referring doctors and their, care and their caregivers. And we need to help them find ways to prevent falls and fractures. So my final bottom line is, let's, as a urologist, take a stand on falls. Let's step up to the plate. Let's recognize the risk of this, and let's not just put this into the uh, ballywick of the primary care physician, the orthopedic ph physician. We have a role in this, and we can't improve on this if we are aware of it.